Hey everyone, this is Martin Willis, your host, and it feels great to be back. I had a lot of fun with uh, Dean last week, co-hosting with him, and uh, it, it was a lot of fun. I'm going to invite him back uh, now and then uh, to do some shows together. I mean, it was great fun. And uh, I also want to thank him kindly for the wonderful job he did in my absence. And it feels great to be back. Our guest tonight is the one and only James Fox. Always uh, love talking to James. He's got great energy. And uh, we're going to be talking about his movie, Moment of Contact. Uh, the blog this week, it's the third in this series. And it's called Behind the Scenes of UFO, of UFO Cover-Up. That was a series uh, back in the 1980s live. It was called UFO Cover-Up? Live. So this is part three on that by Charles Lear. Those are always made into an audio blog. So um, they're up on YouTube and I believe Facebook. Um, anyway, uh, so I, uh, I want to thank everyone for watching the show tonight. I'll try to keep an eye on uh, the chat uh, later on in the show. If you'd like to pose a question, please put it in all caps. And uh, right now, I would like to play the trailer for the movie that we're going to be talking about uh, tonight with James. In 1996, the people of Virginia, Brazil, witnessed a UFO event that would change their lives forever. Só que ele planeava, ia perdendo lentamente a altitude e ia caminhando. Call it another Roswell, if you will. It is a crashed vehicle that had beings on board. Mas que eles não poderiam admitir a verdade a população ia entrar em colapso. Nada temos a esconder. Finally, the facts will be revealed. The Virginia case is considered the most well-kept secret in the military circles of Brazil. My objective here is to put some clarity on what took place in Virginia, Brazil, January 1996. Dois seres extraterrestres foram capturados, depois posteriormente foram levados para o hospital. The witnesses are some of the most compelling testimony I've ever heard. Meu nome é Carlos de Souza. Meu nome é Cátia Xavier. Meu nome é Liliane Silva. Meu nome é Valkyria Silva. Em 1996, eu vi uma criatura estranha ali. Action! A lot of people in this town have a little piece of the puzzle. Naquele local, eu vi o rastro da criatura pé. Foi onde ele falou que que eu vi era uma coisa sobrenatural. This year. Mark Pelicherez, he had captured this creature with his bare hands. Você confirma que o seu irmão estava de serviço naquele dia 20? Confirmo. After he captured the creature, he developed this infection that wouldn't go away. Foi pro CTI de manhã, 7 horas da manhã, 15 para o meio dia, ele veio a óbito. This can no longer be covered up. They might shoot us because we're on the property. Eu levo a defesa, eu levo a defesa, eu levo a defesa, eu levo a defesa, eu levo a defesa. This can't be denied. Bateram na porta. E aí eles falaram pra mim. Ficar quieto. Se qualquer um que ia sofrer uma punição muito severa. This was proof. We pulled this off. It'll be the most compelling testimony revealed. Of contact. Aqui, ó. Foi aqui. This is a level of confirmation that only a handful of people on this planet have. Wow, James. <laughs> I got to see that movie. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's supposed to do, and I think it does a good job at that. Yeah. Uh, so this is great uh, to talk to you once again about this this movie. But now it's in, uh, you've been having a couple of premieres. You have one coming up next week and on uh, right, right on Broadway, right in New York. And uh, you had the one out in L.A. And yes. you've got the, the, and I don't know if you could talk about what you said earlier. Um, it's being reviewed by a major theater. Oh, well, uh, so Regal um, was, I guess, somewhat reluctant to have the premiere at their theater just because it, they weren't sure if there was a demand for it. Um, but that was uh, put to rest after our premiere at uh, LA Live. Um, they opened up their theater in New York and they also 
talked about the possibility of doing scattered screenings across America. So we'll see wow. one, one, one thing at a time. Right. And do you like to, when they're doing a screening or a premiere, you, you are there, right? I mean, you want, yes. and do you actually talk to the people, answer questions, yes. anything like that? You do. Absolutely. Yeah. We do a yeah. Q and A at the end of it. We, yeah. um, we do uh, what is it, step and repeat, you know, people get up and take their picture with the backdrop of moment of contact. And it's a lot of fun. It's, it feels kind of, you know, Hollywood, I guess. And I'm not a Hollywood guy. You know what I mean? I've never lived in Hollywood. I've never wanted to live in Hollywood. <laughs> I've always lived in the country and kind of away from all that. And people are like, if you want to be successful, you have to move to Hollywood. I was like, yeah, that's yeah. not going to happen. I'm happy yeah. And you really live in the country now. I was I've had such a great time visiting you there back in June. I do. Uh, beautiful. I country, right? Yeah. It's gorgeous. Yeah, I like rural. I like mountains. I like nature. I like to go out. I like to hike. I like to see wildlife. You're it right really there. grounds me, you know, and I, yeah. I, I have fun in the cities and that's great. But when it comes to living, I like serenity and peace. And Excellent. Excellent. So how is the, uh, well, we'll talk about, you know, the movie and what it was like to film. And I remember we were in touch when you were down there. Uh, filming and I believe yeah you sent me a text right when you thought you were going to be shot at I remember that that was uh, that was a crazy time down there but uh -huh. <clears throat> so but first of all I'd like to ask you this what what made you decide you were going to look at this and look at it deeply the way and make a, a film about it well okay how far do you want me to go back here um, <laughs> I'll go back to the late 90s <clears throat> There was a gentleman that I worked with who was a co-producer on a film I did called Out of the Blue. Oh, yeah. Great one. Yeah. And I think we started concept with that late <clears throat> 90s, 98, probably <clears throat> 99 would be my guess. Probably 99 because I was filming in Russia in 99. So 98, 99. And my co-producer, one of them, was Boris Zuboff and this other guy named Tim Coleman. And Tim uh said you know when we're sort of mapping the idea of the concept of the film out he was like hey there's this ufo crash in brazil i don't know if you heard about it but apparently these live these aliens survived and they were walking through the town and i was like oh come on what fantasy land are you living in you know and uh i think it really kind of um I, in fact i know it kind of upset tim coleman um because uh i dismissed it so quickly Funny enough, I gave a, if you look at the credits at the end of special thanks, I give a credit to Tim Coleman because he was the one that introduced me to this case. So fast forward, probably 2010, maybe 2011 at the latest, I'm going to a place called Peruibi in the South to give a presentation on a film I did called I Know What I Saw, where I worked on a press club uh, presentation uh, in Washington, D.C. In, in 2007 with the help of Leslie Kane and we flew in all these high level military and government officials from seven countries and they testified as to the reality of the phenomenon as well as pushing for more government transparency yada 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 so in any case i'm uh, about to fly down to brazil and i get a phone call from a buddy of mine who's been very influential uh pulling the strings behind the scenes for me high up on the sort of entertainment food chain his name is jeff sagansky and um, I'm, I'm sure he doesn't mind me. He's got a credit in the movie now as well. He's like, oh, you're going to Brazil. And I said, yeah. He goes, oh, you got to look into Virginia. I was like, oh, my God. Don't tell me this guy's drank the Kool-Aid too. You know, because I'm thinking, okay, we got Tim Cole. And thinking about it, who I have a lot of respect for. Very bright guy. Now I got, you know, this guy. Who's, I think he was head of, former head of Sony Pictures. You can look him up. And uh, now he's telling me. And I was like, uh. Sure, Jeff, I'll look into this alleged UFO crash. Yeah, I'll do that for you. Click. And I thought to myself, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so I went to Brazil. And at the conference, I happened to meet some people uh, that were either direct witnesses or witnesses, friends with some of the witnesses, and uh, kind of piqued my interest a little bit. So I started digging into it. And then I went back uh, four times, each time for about a month. And, um, you know, in, 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 in actuality, I was going to try and put the Virginia case into the phenomenon. 
And I worked on it extensively. I had probably, I don't know, seven to nine months of work on and off of editing. Wow. I had the segment ready to kind of quasi ready to go. And at the last minute, I thought, hmm, no, this doesn't quite fit. It's, it's too much. It's, it's too much. And the story probably deserves a documentary of its own. And I've been working with this guy, fellow producer friend of mine, Marco Leal. Oh, yeah. in, in Brazil for like well over a decade. And he was devastated when the phenomenon, I mean, of course he loved the phenomenon, but he was like, what happened to Virginia? You didn't include it. I said, you know, I think we're going to have to do our own documentary on just that case. So it was a rather lofty task, but um, we, you know, we'd already had, I'd had 10, 11 years under my belt with the case and he's got 15 to 18 years under his belt. And then all the other fellow researchers in Brazil, and we all kind of huddled and and uh, and 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 made it happen. And I, I feel like that there's so much content, so many pieces of the puzzle that it it deserved its own. Uh, it, it deserved to be a film just on that case. You know, I when I watched that. Um, you sent me the, uh, I forget what you call it, the rough cut. Um, I don't know, way back in uh, May, I believe, of this year. By the time I got done watching that, I was pretty much convinced that, and I had heard about this case, you know, years ago, but I was pretty much convinced that there's no way this didn't happen. You know what I mean? It just, and it's bizarre. I mean, uh, I remember feeling after watching this feeling like that poor alien that was that uh was so scared uh according to the two girls uh three girls and uh you know it just makes you feel sorry for him and then you know everybody one of the th all right this is the convincing parts of it to me is everybody's basically describing the same thing you know the oily skin the red eyes the odor sulfur like odor i believe it is and uh, and then there were the the one thing that's a little confusing to me, and you can clear this up. Was there two beings, and one was found that was dead, or is that the same being that was fleeing? So there were reports of up to five beings, ah. but we only had credible testimony, enough substan substantial or substance, on two captures. <laughs> One with the fire department and mm. one with those two military police officers, Eric Lopes and, and Marco Cherise. So we'd heard of accounts, you know, look, nobody in the town ever thought this is an alien from another world. It, not even the people that captured him, Eric Lopes and Marco Cherise. It was like <clears throat> some of the girls that came within eight to 10 feet of this alive being thought it was the devil. People were terrified. Uh, they called it a creature. They called it the devil. They called, they didn't know, you know, but it did have, it did have, uh, according to the witnesses, feelings, fright. It was, mm -hmm. it was feeble. Um, it wanted help. One of the um, aspects of the, encounter with the three girls katya liliani and valkyria there were two sisters that were 14 and 16 and then the older one katya was 21 and they were going through this vacant lot with a cinder block wall and tall grass and it was about three o'clock in the afternoon between three and three thirty in the afternoon it was january 20th hot in brazil during the, their winters are our summers and their summers are our winters right mm. So um, uh, I, I think it was Liliani, the 16-year-old, that saw it first. And again, I remind your, 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 audience, your listeners, it was broad daylight, and they came within 8 to 10 feet of this thing. Now, hmm. it was somewhat like frozen in a position where it had its hands down. It was kind of looking down and kind of squatting down, crouching, and feeble, uh, scared uh non-threatening um suffering and i think liliani let out a yell 
of terror, of, you know, fright. And it turned, so from this position, and it turned and it looked them right in the eyes, okay? Mm. Its eyes were three to four times bigger than that of a human eye. Liliani grabs her 14-year-old daughter, sorry, her 14-year-old sister, Valkyria, and they bolt out of there as fast as they can. Katya, the 21-year-old, is frozen in her tracks, locked eyes on this being, right? And there's some mm. level of communication that's going on during this moment. In fact, that's where the, the uh, title of the film came from is I, as a, as, as a filmmaker, I'm, always, I'm also an editor. I'm, I'm always thinking of um, the audience. I'm, I'm thinking of people that are engaging and in, in, in watching the movie and it's such an extraordinary, potentially once in a lifetime testimony. I, I want, as the director, as 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 an editor, but also as a viewer, I want to be in that moment, that moment of contact, locking eyes with this being. Okay, put me there, and I always want to get as many details as I possibly can because even though it's probably only just a few seconds, time slows down in that moment, right? Hmm. And it's, you have something that's that intense. It's like, right. And, uh, and so I said, you know, put me there in that moment of contact. What did you feel? What did you see? What did you, you know? And that's when she said that it, it was communicating to her that it wanted help. It was scared. It was, it was, it was weak and it was suffering. Hmm. Um, and, and, and I always think about like, imagine a different case scenario. Imagine if these girls had not run off. Imagine if they'd provided this being shelter. Imagine if they'd, you know, I just seen the film mm -hmm. e for the first time in a long time with my son, you know, and mm -hmm. I just thought, wow, the parallels. And I know it sounds like sci science fiction. I, I believe me, I know that. As someone who was making a documentary on the topic of UFOs in the late 90s, and it's made, you know, four since, um, I completely understand the level of skepticism that, that this film could the story could be potentially met with and i don't blame anyone for feeling that way but you, you could imagine like uh had it gone a different route had had these girls decided to help this creature and it almost did make me kind of sad to think about you know representatives of the brazilian military and army and fire department um you know, there was one witness that heard the capture and he said it was crying. They, he, what, and they, they were asking this guy, he was a construction worker, what was, what did you, you know, it's like, it was crying like a baby when they captured it. Oh. Very, very, very scared. It's a very, uh, it's, uh, not that many people that watch this film get that part. But uh, every now and again, I'll get someone go, oh, that moment <clears throat> when that witness said it was crying like a baby really profoundly affected me. Hmm. It did me as well. I just thought, you know, of course I'm, 12 years into this case, I've talked to all the key witnesses. Um, I'm convinced it happened. I wouldn't have wasted all that time otherwise and certainly put my credibility on the line. I get that. But, uh, but I do, it does uh, bother me a little bit that um, how these beings were reportedly uh, treated and, and uh, you know, just what would have happened had the girls, and I'm sure, look, you know, they were uh, perfectly justified to be terrified of this thing. I have no doubt that I probably would have done the exact same thing. But it is makes one kind of curious to know, just to think about, like, you know, in an alternate reality, what would have happened if they would have taken this thing in and provided it shelter and helped it uh, escape the, uh, the capture from the authorities. Wow. But then again, supposedly the, I think it was a military officer, or was it a fireman that carried supposedly carried or captured and carried and he ultimately died yeah uh and so more, yeah so um what we did for the first time that uh, according to all the brazilian researchers that that i worked with is i fly a drone mm -hmm. and i like to get up above an area um you know sighting uh, maybe whether it's a crash site or an encounter or capture or whatever it is and just get some aerial photography. And I did that on a number of uh, pretty much every scene and everywhere we shot across Brazil. And one thing we realized 
see if I can show your, your audience because this is fascinating. This is something that we've determined kind of, well, out in the field, but even more so um, in, the, uh, in the edit room. I'll just show you guys really quickly here. So you've got... Are you drawing something? I am. <laughs> so you've got an area, let's say this is like four square blocks, right? Maybe two here and four across. Now you've got the military blockade here. So we have eyewitness testimony there that the military wouldn't let anybody in. Then you've got this, this one here. This is where the girls encountered the creature at three o'clock in the afternoon, January 20th. And then just a couple blocks away, this is where the capture took place. And again, these are just, you know, four or five square blocks. And we got the whole thing from the air. We realized, my God, this all took place. A lot of this took place in a, in a rather small spot. Um, at about 5 o'clock, 5.30 p.m., a gentleman by the name of Eric Lopes and Marco Chiris are on patrol on the lookout for something strange, something unusual, something like this. They didn't know what. They weren't given that kind of information. And they're driving just a couple blocks away, about two hours after the girls had that encounter with that strange being, when this thing apparently runs right across the road in front of them. And uh, the driver slams his brakes on. Marco Trees in the passenger seat, leaps out. And uh, with very little effort and, and very little resistance, is able to capture this thing with his bare hands. Mm -hmm. Now, according to the researchers and his family, in the process, he got a little scratch here, somewhere mm -hmm. around here on his arm. Not a big scratch, a little scratch. But this creature had this weird oil all over. They all, everybody described this oil, even when it was deceased. It had this weird, oily brown skin with lots of oil, like silicone. And uh, according to uh, the researchers and the family, uh, Marco fell ill. Um, he apparently, within a day or so after, he was rubbing, putting rubbing alcohol all over to get the smell and this oil off of him. Um, within a couple of weeks, he fell ill. He uh, admitted himself to the hospital. Um, he had this uh, systematic immune system failure. The doctor who we interviewed through the book, I mean, through like the kitchen sink, he tried every type of antibiotic and he said his immune system, he'd never seen anything like it 20 plus years prior, 26 years later after, never seen anything like this. Perfectly healthy, 23-year-old soldier dies. Jeez. And um, and for the for the first time in history, the Dr. Cesario, the the very doctor who worked on him back in 1996, um, gave us an on camera interview and and revealed his not only his identity, his face, his everything, and um, it was extraordinary. And and we interviewed the, the his sister, um, uh, Marta, talks about you know the visits they got from the military and what the Brazilian uh, military told the deceased officer's mother and the family, basically that this story was true, that it couldn't come out because society would collapse. That was the justification that they used back in 1996. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, funny enough, I, I uh, probably, probably back in 2014, I was shooting, um, was then called, uh, it's a working title, 701. It ultimately- Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. became the phenomenon and, and uh, i was shooting in los angeles and i was had a laser-like focus on rua at the time i'd flo i was flying in witnesses from different corners of the world um randall nickerson was helping me out with that and uh roger lear found out that i was doing also uh working on virginia and dr roger lear was adamant and i one of my biggest regrets he was adamant to get an interview with me and I had camera crews set up and I was so busy during that time. I kept kind of, you know, delaying this, this interview with him. And he's like, well, and he was kind of upset with me and he's like, well, if you're not going to interview me, I said, no, Dr. Lira, it's not that I don't want to interview you. I've just been so busy. I, you know, all this stuff that was happening. And, and uh, he's like, well, at least take my tapes. Hmm. And I said, uh, your tapes? He said, yeah, I went to Virginia in 2002 and I did extensive 
uh, investigations and interviews and, and you can have them all just take my tapes. So I took all of his tapes and I transferred them digitally. And then I sent them back to him and, uh, he died. Right. Um, yeah, I found out that he died. And, um, and when I read his book, I, anyway, those tapes contained on camera testimony that proved to be in invaluable to right. the production. And we included mm -hmm. him in the film and, and mm -hmm. all that. Um, but he interviewed Marco Trezzi, the deceased military officer involved in the capture. He interviewed his wife. His wife's never been seen before or since in 2002 with mm -hmm. the help of the leading Brazilian UFO researcher, Uberajara Rodriguez. And there was another gentleman named uh, Hector Pacchini who's come back online in the last couple of days, revealing some pretty astonishing uh, facts about the case. But um, um, yeah, uh, Marco Trezzi's wife wasn't ever given uh, any explanation for how exactly, you know, why her husband died, how he died. They were super secretive on the autopsy. They were super secretive on on the uh, deaths, you know, the certificate, they had to like fight to get the, the death certificate. I mean, it was, a, the whole thing was just shrouded in secrecy and and just, they wanted to put his body in the ground immediately. The moment he stopped breathing, they wanted to bury that guy. Hmm. And um, no autopsy, of course, I guess. Well, I'm not entirely sure. They did find some stuff. I, they found some, it, there's a report in the, in the, in the film, but in any case, Dr. Roger Lear, he traveled, he traveled to Brazil in 2002 with a fellow doctor. I have his name. I just don't have it at my fingertips. And they, according to Dr. Roger Lear's book, and I read the book and I've looked at all the tapes and the book for the most part is a transcript of the tapes, hmm. the interviews that he did. However, there were a couple of meetings that Dr. Roger Lear was involved with in his book, according to his book. Everything else was accurate because I had the tapes. He met with a couple of doctors that performed some type of surgery, surgical uh, procedure on one of these creatures that was still alive. And there was some level of communication. Again, this is according to Dr. Roger Lear in his book. And... Uh, I have uh, yet to get access to these doctors. The other uh, gentleman that was traveling with Dr. Roger, unfortunately, by the time I got to him, which was last year, he had just died. So he was the only other person in the room other than Uberajara Rodriguez, and he won't talk to me. Maybe he'll change his mind. But, but again, according to Dr. Roger Lear, in his book, there was communication with the live creature in the hospital with a couple of doctors. Wow. And let's, since, since you're talking about this right now, oh, let me just pull up this question here because um, was there footage taken by a fireman or was this, what is the video that um, I know I talked to you um, offline about this, but, uh, but do you forth, do you see that that video may come available at some point? So, I need to be careful with what I say because I don't want to jeopardize our efforts right now. Sure. Um, let's just put it this way. Uh, just because you definitively locate something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can get your hands on it. Frustrating. Um, uh, to say the least. Um, remember, not a single witness, not a single person that appeared on camera in this film didn't do so very willingly. It mm -hmm. was a fight sometimes, you know, uh, over a decade. Gee. Marco Leal has been working so hard uh, on, on getting some of these people that, that testified for the first time in history on this case. Um, most of them were like, it's never going to happen. We're never going to come forward. In the process of those investigations, we came across 
um, um, very credible sources to photographic evidence, both photo photos and video. Um, and uh, it, it's been more difficult because a lot of the old researchers, there was Claudio Covo, he has since deceased. Uh, there's Ubrajana Rodriguez. And in 2004, 2005, he did an about face. And there is uh, Victor Pacchini, who has disappeared for 18 years, who's just resurfaced last week. Now, that's a very good sign because Pacchini has got his finger on the pulse. He uh, was working with the Brazilian military back in 1996, even taking video statements from them himself as a sort of security for uh, them, the soldiers, that if anything uh, should happen to them, those tapes that were scattered all across the, the, the country would be released. And so, um, hmm. yeah, and so uh, uh, he has decided for whatever reason, uh, just last week, um, I'm getting back in and I'm going after uh, everything that I know. And um, so we now we have him on our on our on our team. And so um, and he just spoke with the New York Post as well as another eyewitness. I don't know if you guys managed to catch that New York Post article by yes. uh, Matthew Schellenberger, I believe it was. Um, those guys actually did due diligence. I mean, they really they needed to talk to more than just one person who who's seen the footage of the creature and they, 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 they really worked on it for uh, at least a week, um, talking to, talking to people in Brazil and they put that together pretty nicely. And if you read that article that gives like, um, unprecedented testimony of what the videotaped evidence reveals. And it's pretty remarkable. I highly suggest anyone out there to go read that New York post article. Now there was two, one that came out, I think, on a Friday. The second one that's far more elaborate with photographs. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm checking, I think it's Schellenberger. I, I could look it up right now so you'll know for sure. Well, because I'm I'm, I'm going to pull it right up here in just a second. Here. Okay, great. Yeah, because uh, I'm telling you, these guys did their due diligence. And Michael Schellenberger, yeah, he did a great job. He spoke directly for the first time in history. Yep uh yeah so scroll down on that is that uh because again there was two no see that's the wrong one that's, that's the, wrong the wrong one, one. yep that's okay the wrong one. so it's that's the, the one that's, that's the one that i read i didn't read the other one but the other no. one is the only one worth reading <laughs> yeah no i'm okay. just telling you because he's got for the first time in history he's got uh accounts is this it michael schellenberg that's it yeah okay that's the article so that's the one okay. you guys want to read it's out. And right. I will link. I will link this in the show notes for mm -hmm. for everyone. Yeah. That's got never before seen or, or heard testimony, detailed testimony of what the photographic evidence reveals. And both of the people in the article uh, know where that footage is. Wow! So you've actually personally have spoken to someone that has actually seen the video is three people you've spoken to three people that have seen the video i mean to me that's that's pretty compelling and i remember i know you're pretty can't compelling say and pretty frustrating <laughs> yeah i remember um you mentioned that it's not about a money thing there's money that will not change uh, the way someone might release that that has their hands on it. I don't know how much you can say or can't say here, but I remember that was kind of the theme that you had mentioned what was going on at the time. So it has to be another type of motivation for this person to let this go. Well, you know, people that participated in the film um, <clears throat> were so scared. Just eyewitnesses. OK, not not eyewitnesses that had evidence, but just eyewitness eyewitnesses to the event. People that participated in one way or another with the capture of the transportation, mm -hmm. anything like that. Terrified. I mean, look at uh, Eric Lopes when we rolled up on him at his house. Oh, yeah. That was a real scene. 
There wasn't yeah. anything that was staged in there. That happened as it happened. And I said to one of the leading Brazilian UFO researchers just recently, my God, I think we almost got shot mm. when we went to Eric Lopes's place. I mean, that was no joke. It's a military intelligence officer. Um, he said, to the, the researcher said, back in 1996, he made it certain to me as clear as day, steer clear if you want to stay alive. Like, do not even think of coming near me as, as trying to get any statements out of me. And this guy could so easily have just come out of the house and said, you know, this, this whole thing is just a bunch of nonsense. It's gotten way out of hand. There's nothing to any of it. I didn't, I wasn't driving the car that night of the capture. Easily. He could just easily make a statement and be, be done with it. But instead, he says, uh, if you're here to talk about the ET, he's not going to say anything. And bullets are going to start flying if you don't get out right. of here. Yeah. You know? You had the translator uh, make that pretty clear. Well, quickly. he didn't actually make it clear in the field. That was later than oh, in the interview. No. I realized Is that, that right? I oh. My life well, three times. You kind of were life. scattering, though. I had no idea. I mean, yeah. it was pretty intense. I mean, one of the things that I've talked about on a couple of podcasts that, uh, you know, for those of you who've seen the scene, um, I could see Dave, Dave West, our DP, uh, said he had the wrong lens. He was not anticipating that type of encounter. He was expecting <clears> the guy to come out and he could, but he was up in a window looking down at us at a, at a distance, at a little bit of a distance. But I was right across from him and I, and I was, look, it was Portuguese being spoken quickly. It was very intense. I could feel the atmosphere, the tense atmosphere. And I looked this man in the eyes and I've never in all my years seen a face like his, like, like the, like the eyes and the face had been harboring a deep, dark secret. And that had taken a toll on him. Mm. I've never seen it, anything like it. If you could imagine, and look, I'm just, you know, this guy might not have seen anything, but I, 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 I'm pretty sure he did. But if you can imagine witnessing an event of that magnitude, hmm. having one of your best friends die as a result of it, and the whole world coming after you for answers, the military saying, you know, God knows what the military told him. Um, imagine having to shelter that that secret for 26 years and imagine how that might affect i mean look he won't even give a statement to his very dear friend marco trees's family okay so he lost a friend during that at the, after that mm. night mm. and eric lopes married the deceased officer's sister okay when, after that encounter, we contacted his wife, Eric Lopes's wife. What is it going to take to get a statement on camera from Eric Lopes? Her response was, you bring my brother back to life and he'll talk with you. Oh, my God. Wow. I swear, I swear that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a, a couple of things um, comes to mind. Uh while we're talking here, you showed earlier on, you showed the, the block where, you know, the, the, the square of, of and where the witnesses were. Uh, so that general area, how far away as the crow flies, would you say the purported qua crash was? I think it was about six miles. And I've always confused with the, uh, you know, I know, I understand kilometers. I used to live in Europe. So, but I, but I think the researchers said it was roughly 10 kilometers. So I'm going to say roughly six miles, six miles mm -hmm. away. Now there's a, a river near the alleged impact site that leads right to where the entities near where the entities were seen. It's just speculation and nobody knows for sure how they got from the impact site to the river. Some people said maybe they had an escape pod. Some people said maybe they got in the river. Nobody knows. Hmm. But about and six miles. I see. But and as the crow flies. Has anyone ever talked about retrieval? 
Military X is the closest we got because he was at, he was stationed at, as a military base. And well, we had we, we had a couple people that we interviewed from as a military base, and they they had talked about all this unusual activity at the time, like activity that's never before or since happened, secrecy, weird activity, Americans flying in. Um, and according to military X's good friend who was stationed, who was also at, as a military base, he was involved with the, um, the ground operation, uh, the army had for the, uh, for the crashed object. But military X was not involved with that aspect. He just said, this is what my friends said that it all started at Myolini farm, which is where Carlos de Souza the ultralight pilot and, and and professor in Sao Paulo uh, saw this strange cigar-shaped object crash on the morning of January thirteenth, nineteen ninety-six. And was that the same the same day that no. the creatures? No, no. Nope. The girls saw the creatures on the twentieth. Wow! So seven days went by. Seven days. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. I, I I didn't know that part of it. Now, how after this happened? Um, how long did it stay relevant that you're aware of, like maybe military interrogations or like the buzz? How long did the buzz last before it just kind of faded away? Do you did you look into any of that? Um, yeah, I would say probably 18 months. You mm. know, in the military, uh, we we actually have the archive press conference, uh, that. Uh, General Lima had given at, as a military base. I, I don't know if you remember that part of the film or not. It's towards the end. Uh, it's it's quite, it, it, it speaks volumes, not just what he says, but what he doesn't say. Hmm. I, I do remember. I do remember that. Yes. Um, now, as let's just talk about what's been happening uh, since the film has come out. Uh, and what's been the reaction of the media, for one thing, to, to your film? Well, I know how skeptical I was. In fact, I wouldn't even call it skeptical. I would call it dismissive. As someone who was making their second documentary on the topic of UFOs, dismissed it so quickly so I know what we're up against in the terms of of um, acceptance or even willingness to look at the the case. And I say to people, look, I get it. Um, but I'm asking you just, you know, just imagine, just suspend judgment and imagine if it did happen, uh, you know, uh, how significant of a story would it be? But also uh, to just listen to the eyewitness testimony and and uh, uh, and draw your own conclusions. Um, Remarkably, so far, it hasn't gotten the level of mainstream attention that the phenomenon got. Hmm. Uh, but it's been getting some attention. Um, we got we were on uh, CNN for I don't know seven plus minutes the other night. That very rather serious um, show. I did Fox News. That was rather serious. It wasn't um, ridiculed. Uh, we've been written up in a few publications, done countless, uh, you know, radio and a few TV appearances, um, getting write-ups all the time. It's getting great reviews. People just saying, look, I understand, like, how this sounds, but uh, but take a moment and look at this film. It's actually, you know, and um, <clears throat> I understand that there's going to, because I feel like a, I'm, I'm out there a little bit um, being hung out to dry a little bit. You know, you've got all the... Um, you know, the military intelligence people that I'm sure have a lot more answers that could, um, that could add credence to this case. And I'm hoping that that, uh, is something that's going to occur in the not so distant future. I'm told that it is, but we'll see. I would feel it would be nice to have a little more support. And I know, you know, people are probably scratching their heads and thinking, do, do, do I want to get into this arena or not? And I don't blame them, particularly the fact that, you know, we do uh, in no uncertain terms point the finger at the United States involvement here. Uh, yeah, which is really bizarre. 
according to the Brazilian. I mean, look, we had no intentions when we were in the field. We were just asking these questions. Eyewitnesses were telling us about these men that showed up and dark, spooky men in dark suits and the intimidation and and then the flight control guys that were saying that the you know that a United States Air Force came in. So we have like the the people on the ground in the army base telling us everywhere where these things went, right? In great detail. And then we have on the very day that those, you know, alleged beings arrive at Espasex uh, military base in Campinas, we get the flight controllers telling us that this United States Air Force flight flew in unauthorized from the Brazilian government. Yeah. To covert mission that lands and s dispatches two helicopters. Those helicopters go to Virginia, hello, okay, and then come back to Espasex Campinas military base and back to the United States, you know, like, well, that's quite a bit, quite a bit of a, but a bit of a coincidence, don't you think? <laughs> wow. Wow. Now, how is this impacting in Brazil? Is hmm. what's going on when people see this film there? Um, it's been, uh, it hasn't been, it's, it's, the price point for uh, the purchase of the film, which just changed today or yet or last night, now it's available to rent, which makes it a lot more affordable. The first couple of weeks, it's a thing they do. They sell it only and you get the bonus material, blah, blah, blah. Um, now that price point has jumped down. But despite that, it has been trending as uh, I think last I heard was number 28 of all films on the uh, apple i guess it's apple or itunes i think in in brazil but that was a purchase price but that's mm. gone down as of today basically this morning um it's been uh performing very very well and there's a couple of uh very big platforms that are negotiating distribution in all of brazil as of like right now i see now what is the most common debunk no matter what case there is Mm. There's debunking always. And so what is the most common theme of um, a, a debunker? So about what's this case? The, what the uh, what the Brazilian military was trying to do was to get uh, the mother of the of the two daughters to basically and bribe them with money to and I've got their testimony on camera talking about this and get them to say that it was like a deranged man who had health issues that was kind of homeless and he was curled up in this weird position. And in actuality, it was just that they have a name for him. He's known in the town of Virginia. I've actually seen him um, and they refused to do it. So mm -hmm. the military put out a statement that what the girl saw was just this like deranged man and, and, and a midget, you know, just, just absolutely absurd. And, and all the locals and anyone who had anything to do with the case laughed it off. But, uh, you know, people that are unfamiliar with the case, yeah, you know, it, it added, it, 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 it muddied the waters a little bit. It muddied that's, the waters. that's their purpose. And, uh, yeah, uh, uh, everyone also, one of the things I'd mentioned, you know, was the oily skin, the red eyes, but the forked feet, that's another one that everyone also mentions. Yeah. So, you and know, hands. Yeah. yeah. So it was like this. Now, we were speculating that there was another appendage that was usually kind of tucked in like this, but when they walked, it came out, which would, um, cause it'd be much harder to walk on this than it would be on this, hmm. um, which would explain the, uh, mother of the two girls when she went to the site right after the girls had claimed to have seen this thing, it had an imprint in the sand there. And the imprint was like that. And she drew it on, on paper, but she said it was clear as day. Like there was, that weird footprint um hmm. not, and these things were they and were the naked smell. basically smell. yeah the yeah. smell yeah. Mm -hmm. everyone talks yeah. about the smell and how they couldn't get rid of the smell and they yeah. said like you know if you've ever been close to a skunk <laughs> like close range to Too a skunk and it, yeah when it released its its magic um yeah they said it was like a hundred times stronger than that oh terrible crazy right yeah yeah i know now I, i'm gonna post a couple of questions and just in uh three mm -hmm. minutes here we're going off kgr a radio and uh if it's okay we'll go a little longer okay um and 
just uh, just to let the people know over on KGR a radio next week's going to be George Simpson on the Valentech uh, UFO oh, incident God. in Australia. When I was yeah. in Australia, somebody let me hear that. Um, oh, the tape, on, the original. Wow, that was spooky, man. Wow, I would love to hear that. He's because of what it. what you can hear on it now, right now, is a. Oh, I heard it. A, I heard it. I heard it. A, a remake. Yeah. No, no, I heard it, and it was very spooky because he's describing this object. It's not an aircraft. It's not an aircraft. It's getting closer. It's getting closer. And then you hear this like metallic sound, and then. Mm. Gone. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, that's another really compelling case. So here's a, a question in the chat, uh, Dr. Richard. How did the witnesses respond to yes, the thank you. Medina, Medinino yes. explanation? Oh, it was, it's an absolute, complete and utter joke. I mean, the witnesses are like, yeah, I'm not even going to answer that. That's just absurd. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't even know what does that mean? The Medino. Medino is the little, small, kind of slightly um, disfigured. He's he's got uh, a, he's got a physical handicap, and he's just kind of small and kind of slightly just disfigured. And um, yeah, and his Medino is he's the guy I've seen him. He was pointed out to me just last year. He's still around. Um, you know, here's here's a question. Someone wanted to know if you would ever make a documentary on the Socorro UFO incident. But I guess what I'd like to ask on top of that. Did. Huh? Yeah, I did that was already. part of it in the phenomenon. Yeah, but ha have you have do you have something else uh planned? That's something I have to ask you. Do you have a after this one? Is there I mean you never sit still. <laughs> so I'm not uh, even sitting still now. <laughs> I know. So do you have something else? Yes, I'm, I I, I want to um, I, I want to go after the evidence. You know, I I I had the uh, distinct um, honor of being able to thank you, George Knapp, interview the late Senator uh, Harry Reid. Harry, yeah. And when he said what he said to me on camera regarding the evidence that has been revealed to the general public being just the tip of the iceberg. It's what we've kind of all suspected. And I'd met with a number of military witnesses and civilians too, primarily military, that had handed over very compelling evidence of the phenomenon and to some unknown government agency only to be whisked off and disappeared in some vault somewhere. So when he said, you know, look, what's been released is only the tip of the iceberg. It makes you want to dig a little deeper. And then, of course, when I did this story and found out the Americans' involvement, and found out the Americans came and took the bodies, according to all the military witnesses that we spoke to. James, I have to do this real quickly. We're going off KGRA radio. Thank okay. you, everyone. We'll be back next week. And go ahead, continue, please. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I decided that I, I wanted to... Um, uh, I, I want to go after it. I want to start asking questions. I want to walk the halls of Congress. I want to talk to people part of the task force. I want to know where this, this evidence is mm. and who has the authority to release it. I would like to know that too, because it exists. We know it does. Somewhere. And uh, it's whether it's, concerned. yeah, I mean, whether it's hidden away from oversight somehow through you know, uh, a private entity or something. I mean, it just seems like, I mean, there's, you can how go on and know, on. How could you so know? many cases? Yeah. Well, how can you know it's there like Senator Reed and not know where it is? So, you know, hmm. in other words, it has to exist because he's talking about it. He knows it's there and it can't be, it's like, who can release this stuff? That's the, the million dollar question. Where is it and who can release it? Enough of these blurry videos. Like, let's put that to rest once and for all. And, and, um, hang on just a minute. A uh, question just came up here. Um, through my text, I get, uh, this is from my buddy, Dean Alioto. Uh, uh, Dean. Yeah, Dean, he just texted me. What do you think? This is his question. What do you think the effect on humanity be, would be if they were shown such hidden evidence? The evidence you're talking about well i mean look I, I think if it was i mean we've already had disclosure with a small d right hmm. so it's kind of 
it's kind of unfolding as as we as we sit and talk. Um, however, I think if it was confirmed on a global level, uh, with it would have to be in cooperation with you know governments. Um, I, I've said this before. I've been, I've been, I'll, I'll say it again. I I'm a firm believer that it would have a very unifying effect on uh, on humanity. That mm. it would um kind of force us to see ourselves for who we really are and that is uh one people one one species one race one planet um and uh i long for that 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 revelation mm -hmm. that that impact but i'm but i'm convinced that it, it that it would um have that effect on us so um you know some people say look or you know organized religions would crumble on the financial markets yeah, i don't stuff. think so i yeah. don't necessarily believe that i mean like maybe they know something that's truly horrifying that that rightfully so they feel they need to keep from us but even if it's scary i still think that we should know it's part of the bigger picture it's part of who we are and um you know look um Dr. Edgar Mitchell said to me, you know, we still have to take out the garbage and yeah. go to and, work. And I agree with that. I, and I think, personally, I think that, um, you know, we're such an ephemeral society anyway. Like, oh, that's amazing news. And oh, my God. And a month later, we'd all be doing uh, looking at our iPhones. And, and, you know, I think we would just kind of move on just knowing unless, you know, we knew something that they were, were, uh, were on the menu. I had a guy in a parking lot just recently. <laughs> this is so bad. <laughs> Looking at his phone, walking, walks right into my car. <laughs> oh, like, yes. yeah. oh, my God. You're walking through a crowded parking lot with cars, and you're staring at your phone. What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, you oh. see that all the time. Oh, yeah. my God. What is going on? I know, guys. Yeah. Walking hey, across the street. Could you imagine walking across a crosswalk? Looking I have seen it. You know, when way back, I'm talking about over 10 years ago, I was on a bus at Logan Airport and a woman walked right across the street looking at her phone and the bus had to slam on the brakes. You know, so that that's going way back before Facebook. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, again, I'm going to try to put up some of these questions. Yes. Um, did. Ray wanted to know: Did they take a skin graft? Do we? What do we know that they did in the hospital? Do we know anything? Well, from what the doctor told me, um, I should have asked those those specific questions. That's a good question. Um, and I mentioned it in the movie. There was an unknown substance, eight percent. I don't know. I'm not sure if it, was, if it was a bacteria or what it was. It's in the autopsy report. There was something unknown to the doctors they couldn't recognize that they believe caused Marco Cherisi's immune system to systematically shut down and that the antibiotics that they were giving him to treat this general infection was powerless. And wow. you know, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a shame. Uh, so this kind of goes along with what you uh, were talking about earlier. Did you look up anyone in the U.S. to see if it was brought here. So that was just basically a rumor. Um, you didn't, ha there's no real confirmation that the Zero. beans were brought. Yeah. Zero. Up here. Nope. So, just the Brazilian right now. Nothing in America, but I haven't stuck my teeth into this one yet. Yeah. Well, it's such a strange thing that, <clears throat> pardon me, that we would show up there, the U.S. would show up there to begin with. And, you know, I mean, it, it's so bizarre to hear yeah. that we would, we have go to a different country yeah. for well, something like this. You know what? I, I tell you, pretty much every single case that I have personally investigated dating back to the 50s, I have either witnesses on camera or that have told me personally that there was an unknown U.S. government agency, a man in a suit, plain clothes, they're trying to either sanitize, you know, take the evidence, um, influence the witnesses, uh, 
you know, both military and civilian. I mean, I could go on till tomorrow morning. But when I came to Brazil, and when the mother of those two young women uh, was coerced and and tried to be manipulated and um, bribed um, by, um, she called them foreigners. She was pretty convinced that two of them were from the United States but they were quiet with clipboards. Uh, I don't know. I felt compelled that I can no longer ignore this aspect of the phenomenon, that there truly is some unknown. I know it's like such a buzzword, right? You go, oh, men in black. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. you just want to just go, oh God, not this. (laughs) But I I felt compelled to no longer ignore and to actually include um, testimony. Like I said, I've got testimony dating back to the 50s of people talking about this this unknown government agency that's um, just uh, harassing, basically harassing, trying to influence them, trying to you know take any photographic evidence they may have, digging through their homes, intimidation, that kind of thing. The only thing I think it could sound like a branch of is the CIA. You know, I mean, what other group, government group, would be involved in something like this? Well, they've got a they've got a an uncanny ability to um, monitor all these cases because, mm. you know, I, I could tell you an example. When I interviewed Parviz Jafari in 2007, he was the Iranian pilot that had this dramatic encounter with the UFO. Oh, yeah. Tried mm-hmm. to shoot at it in 1977. 76. Mm-hmm. Yeah, over mm-hmm. Tehran. And, um, he said that the very next morning, there were deep in the debrief, there was a uh, a man from the United States there asking questions, and you know, when I was I- interviewing uh, General William De Brower, Wilfred Wilfred De Brower, Wilfred, uh, he, yeah, yeah, I think it was uh, late eighties, early nineties, that flap over Belgium, mm-hmm. the big triangular shape, you know, yeah. the scrambled jets, yada yada yada. And Wilford de Brower said that there were two men in suits from the U.S., some unknown government agency, and they were um, they were asking for the video to the cockpit recordings of of these jets that were scrambled to intercept. And Wilford de Brower said, "Sure, I can make copies of those for you, but I need an official request." And they refused to do that because then there'd be a paper trail. Hmm. And you know, you talk to um, uh, uh, Deputy Base Commander Colonel Charles Halt regarding the the Bentwaters UFO incident, December 1980. And he said that uh, men from an unknown government agency showed up and um, basically took over, subjected his witnesses, his men, to uh, sodium pentothal, I guess it is, Mm -hmm. serum, as well as like, you know, just obfuscated whatever evidence there was on the base. He didn't know where they were from. They flew in from some other base. Well, and and thing with the, on and on and on and yeah. on and on and on. Think on. about the 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 Princeton, um, you know, the Tic Tac, uh, yeah. with the plain clothes. You know, it wasn't a suit, but still plain clothes. Two people show up and take the data bricks. You know, they're released to them, mm. and they show up on an aircraft carrier, not the Princeton, the uh, Nimitz. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's so, so bizarre. And it's you know, you can go back on through time and all kinds of cases and someone shows up mysteriously and like you said very quickly after yeah there was uh the the mcminnville oregon case yeah with paul and evelyn trent Mm -hmm. there was the 1965 santa Ana rex heflin Mm -hmm. with the polaroids he had government agencies showing up harassing him actually took his photographic evidence it was returned to him before he died 20 whatever 30 years later which uh, um, Anne Hogel. Yeah. Yes, it's in her safe. Um, yeah, but she's deceased. Yeah, but her daughter has it. I talked okay, to her. Good, yeah. good. God, yeah. I loved her. We, we did a, a brilliant interview with her on camera, which at some point I should release that with her holding those amazing Polaroids. I got to hold those in my hand. Yeah. But in any case, Evelyn Trent in 1950, McMinnville, Oregon. She had this guy show up in a suit from an unknown government agency and ransacked her whole house where I know there's negatives here. What else you got? There's more photographs, this kind of thing. And just left her house just totally trashed. And, and yeah. And, and, you know, it just goes on and on and on. So 
you know. <laughs> and it's not like a, it's not like Project Blue Book. I mean, there are some cases where, you know, someone showed up from there shortly after, quickly after, but uh, an incident. But it's not like uh, they're letting themselves be known who they are. Well, you know, it reminds me of the 1964 Socorro, New Mexico case with Officer Lonnie Zamora. Somebody had just mentioned it earlier on the show. Right. And uh, I have a tape recording of Officer Zamora talking about, uh, you know, the military officers and the FBI were on the scene like lickety split. I mean, within under an hour, I mean, the, the bushes were still smoldering, footprints from the creatures, all that stuff. And he said that they took him in to a room and basically interrogated him for hours, hours. Okay. Mm -hmm. They had a book of photographic evidence on other similar cases in the, in and around the area. Yeah. And uh, basically told him, don't talk about it. And the, and the aspect they, they, that they really didn't want to talk about him talking about was the close encounter of the third kind was the fact that he claims to have saw to have seen entities associated with that landed craft, which he described as a white egg which right. kind of reminds you of a tic tac a little bit, but he described it as an egg, and um, but that was one aspect that, according to Officer Zamora, that the military just absolutely did not want him to go into because it's much more difficult to uh, explain beans on the ground than it is an unknown object in the sky. I interviewed this guy and I came upon him randomly. I remember his first name is George, and I'd have to look it up, but he, as a child. Um, back in the uh, late fifties, I think it was, uh, had quite a UFO sighting, and he wrote a letter to the Air Force and sent it to them. His mother let him do it, and these two guys show up, uh, one in uniform, one not in uniform. Mm -hmm. uh, and he later identified as Rupal, um, and so they showed up at his house and Rupel, yeah Rupel from from uh yeah from Project. blue book yeah so they show up at his house and they he bring him into his room into a room talking to him about you know exactly what he saw and all this and they brought in a photo album and showed him pictures and was saying did it look like this did it look like this and he was here looking at these different ufos and then they kind of really interrogated this little kid nine years old or something like that it's quite a story, but you know, I mean, for someone to write a letter and someone to show up is. Well, you know, what's really funny is that I uh, got to go through uh, Lonnie Zamora's with the, um, um, uh, his wife, Mary agreed. Uh, he was, had unfortunately uh, died in 2008, I think it was. Um, and Mary died, uh, his wife died, I think last year or maybe 2020 yeah. COVID. Unfortunately, she yeah. got, she got, she got COVID. Yeah. Um, bless her heart. She let me go through Lonnie's, uh, duffel bag of material from, you know, 50 plus years, I guess, from that case. Wow. And he had all these letters and I scanned as much as I could, um, with her blessing. And uh, there was one in particular, and it was a guy had a rather one-off name. It was something Seacrest. Anyway, I just, it was clearly a guy, I mean, a, a young lad that might have been like, you know, seven or eight, nine years old, who writes mm -hmm. this letter, Dear Lonnie, you know, a friend of mine's got these, you know, photographs of something similar to what you saw. We live over here. Love to hear back from you. Very curious to what you saw. And I thought, eh, you know, this, I, I looked at the guy and, and I found him on Facebook <laughs> 50 years later. And I, I amazing photographs and I said, did you write this letter? And he said, Oh my God, that's me. I, I can't believe that. He said, Lonnie never wrote me back. Wow. I said, well, I found the letter at Lonnie's home and, uh, you know, I just thought I would, uh, Say hello. <laughs> and I well, think his letter is actually in the movie. Yeah. Jan something Seacrest. Anyway. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Well, I got to say, James, you live the life. You know, you live the life I would love to live and, and go to these places and talk to these people and actually, you know, get this great stuff. And I do have to say my two 
yeah. favorite movies when I first started looking into this, I've told you this before, was Out of the Blue and I Know What I Saw. Those are absolutely my favorite movies when I started looking into the subject and they still, they still say, hold up. Thank you. You know, I actually watched Out of the Blue, the director's cut, because I spent another couple years on, on that film after we finished it and sold it to NBC Universal. I uh, did a lot of work to it. Wow. I mean, almost made it a new film. But, uh, and I watched it in a theater maybe seven or eight years ago. And I thought, oh God, am I ready for this? You know, <laughs> but honestly, I was shocked at how well it, I am, how much I enjoyed it. Yeah. It's a oh, good Oh, it's great. Film. And I, I suggest to any of the listeners out there, if you haven't watched yeah. this, it's, it's one to watch. It's a great I one. mean, I don't know. I I thought that I know what I saw was a little better, but a lot of people don't feel that way. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, they both deserve a look at, if you ask me. I mean, you um, can tell the difference between me in Out of the Blue and I Know What I Saw and me in Moment of Contact. Because yeah. I've got like, you know, probably the better, yeah, 20 years, 20 years on me. I had no gray hair. <laughs> I had a beautiful, like, you know, Young youthful face. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, well, I think you're aging really well myself. But oh um, no, hey, I'm I'm yeah. not complaining at all. I'm just it's just funny, you know. It's it's funny yeah. to see yourself over the yeah. decades, you know, especially when right. it's documented like that, you know. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so getting back to the case here, I'm going to pop pop up some questions. Um, the uh, Virginia. Oh, now Ray wanted to know why didn't i know you probably don't have an answer for this but why didn't the x-ray technician ever get the substance tested after people left his room had you ever spoken to the x-ray technician i can't remember yeah he went uh, on on camera but had you know from the back and had to have his voice disguised he was terrified and i think uh, marco leal spent seven or eight years uh convincing him to finally coming forward and then doing so it, look, we didn't have an option. It was like, you know, you're going to film me from the back and disguise my voice or I'm not coming in this film. That's it. He said that the military arrived at the hospital, big military scene, trucks, Jeeps, police, everybody armed. And it wasn't a lot of talking. This is what you're going to do. They put this thing in a, in a body bag on the table you're going to take these x-rays. You're not going to look at these x-rays. You can't, you can't even verify that the x-rays came out. Hmm. And he said that smell of that thing was the, the, so bad they had to close that section of the hospital off for several days while they disinfected it. Jeez. And it, it lingered in his sinuses. And, and uh, I, I don't know, you know, it was in a body bag. So, you know, he, like I said, he couldn't, I don't think there was anything to analyze. Mm. he didn't have access to any of it wow. wouldn't it have been cool if he would have made a couple extra copies and didn't tell them <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's it's it seems like you know if this video ever comes out i mean that and it's considered authentic in every which way i mean that seems like a game changer for everything i, I think so you know i mean ultimately i would love to see it come out in an official capacity. I mean, I'd love the Brazilian military to say, you know what, it's been 26 years, the vast majority of us leaders at the time, Olympio and, and uh, Lima, uh, since retired, we're um, in our twilight years and uh, we're gonna go ahead and, and release it. Now that would be the most legitimate way. Obviously, if it's gonna have to be done anonymously, then of course, there's gonna be a lot of people that aren't gonna believe it and I don't blame them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, we're doing the best we can. Uh, if mm -hmm. anybody thinks that uh, it's not an all hands on deck situation, I beg you guys to think again. If anybody thinks that there's anybody out there that wants to get their hands on this more than me, then I, I ask you to reconsider that as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, every time someone creates a film of any kind like you have here, there seems like uh, seems like they get contacted by witnesses has that happened like all of a sudden has have new witnesses come forward or anything like that or new stories from people two. that may have been involved too two 
Mm -hmm. And that's just getting started. Yeah. This has not blazed its way across Brazil yet. Mm -hmm. In fact, the film is just getting out there now. I mean, it's going to be a while. I mean, it's only been like, what, two weeks? If that. Mm. Yeah, probably mm -hmm. two weeks. So there's another premieres that are happening in Virginia, I think, on mm -hmm. the... Heck, what's the date today? Uh, today is the first. So I think on the 8th, there's going to be two premieres in the town of Virginia with the mayor and wow. a whole bunch of people. It's going to be a kind of a big deal. The press yeah. is going to be there. Um, so look, th this is just getting out there. I'm extremely confident that additional uh, eyewitnesses, this is what we were hoping this film would do. Its job is to trigger further uh, you know, military to come forward, encourage further possible, uh, you know, United States cooperation for them to come for somebody uh, on that side to come forward. And I'm, I'm confident that, that, that will, it always does happen. It always does. Yeah, happen. It does. And, um, you, you mentioned earlier that people seem to be very cautious and not really every person you said, was hard to talk to about. Oh, did not, not want to talk about. Almost impossible. And is that because of intimidation? Yeah, they were terrified. Hmm. Every single witness, and they weren't like I didn't have anyone sit there and say to me, "Oh, if you do this, I'm going to shoot you and your family." That's not what they said. Hmm. You know, it was like the consequences will be very severe. Do yeah. not, you know, when we were in Virginia, we had either just met with some military guys. Or we were about to meet with them. And the military base as a, started calling around to the witnesses. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> you still living over at uh, this address? Oh, good, good, good. How's the family? Mm -hmm. Jeez. Hey, um, there's an American documentary film crew here now. Did, 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 did they reach out to you? Have you met with them? Did you hear anything about them kind of thing? Yeah. That was so still ongoing 26 that, years later. That was that was spooky. Yeah, that is. That, that was is. spooky to them and it was spooky to us because we'd just gotten, you know, threatened at gun, you know, we didn't pull the gunner out in our face, but like bullets are going to start flying basically if you don't get the hell out, out of here. Mm -hmm. And I asked, you know, people also because people kind of criticize, like, oh, you went to the guy's house. What did you expect? I'm like, well, you know, every other option had been exhausted for 20 years six years so with the help of the mayor the current mayor of virginia we located this witness and went to his house hmm. there was no other option it was either that or don't even bother trying yeah. so naturally you know i'm going to go out there and try and we did would you have if you could do that whole thing over again would you have sent one person or something like that that, to that, that had, door that had been done a thousand times. Ah, mm -hmm. the family had done that a thousand times. Yeah, the sister had done that a thousand times. Well, you know that that kind of says volumes for. And I know. think that if I possibly went over there by myself, um, and I had I not been with the Brazilian, you know, counterparts, particularly that guy that we were with, Homolo, who's quite famous in Brazil, in Virginia. He might have just shot me on the spot, you know. <laughs> yeah, and well, that that speaks to that he is really scared. You know, that's that's what that's about. There's there's no no other uh, reason he would act like that, right? So, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, regarding the crash, I know I'm just going to go through these questions and then we can wrap it up basically here. Okay, but, I'm going to go uh, read to my son. I'm going to read to oh, my son. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. we're ready to wrap up here in just yeah. a minute, but. Uh, so there was never every night. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Ollie. Hey, Ollie. I know uh, a little Ollie. Yep. Uh, uh, all right. Great kid. So what was the evidence for a crashed ship? Was debris ever seen? Now, did your witness actually see he saw a crash? Oh, so yeah. He actually did he go? Oh, yeah. Yes. He held the debris in his hands. He did. Oh, yeah. And it crumpled yeah. it up. Mm -hmm. And just like Roswell, it. Yeah, and we released. talked to the, we also, it's funny actually, because we interviewed in 2013 the farm hand at Maiolini Farm, and he talked about the neighbors reporting a big boom, like a big impact 
like they heard it crash because it crashed at like five o'clock in the morning so it was dusk hmm. and uh or dawn i'm so sorry dawn uh, and um uh, there were military officers on the scene they knew it was coming down they were on the scene within five minutes and carlos de Souza, the ultralight pilot and professor had watched it crash and drove up to the debris field never once in a million years did he think it was an alien spaceship he thought it was maybe some prototype some ex- sure I know what it was but the smell and then the, the nature of the debris and then of course the military pointing guns at him and ordering him to leave and then the men in black that came to visit him and all that stuff he's like jesus they are really going out of their way to cover this up yeah like, what i see and then other reports started coming out of the beans and that's okay that's that was a vehicle from another another whatever somewhere okay. else yeah uh james as always it's been uh, a complete pleasure to speak with you oh martin it's always a pleasure to speak with you too and it sounds like i might see you in new mexico in march maybe uh, i definitely would consider that okay it would be great to do some type of show or something there too i always like to have that so i can write it off you know for taxes <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's such a pleasure. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, oh, I ask your audience one thing, if you don't mind, I know some people might consider it a bit of a pain in the neck. It's extremely helpful to me, to us, is to rate the film on iTunes or Amazon. If you rent it, it's very helpful to rate it for us. If you rent it, rent it, the cheapest place is Amazon. If you buy it, get it from, I think, Vimeo or iTunes because you get like two hours of bonus material at the same price. Wow. So if you rent it, go to Amazon. If you buy it, do it at iTunes. And if you could rate rate the film on Amazon, iTunes, that would be tremendously helpful with the algorithms and, and, and uh, greatly appreciated. Excellent. All right, James, you take care and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Martin. Bye. All right. Yeah. Bye. All right, everyone, uh, don't forget, we'll be back next week with George Simpson talking about the Valentech uh, Australian case. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky.